Hello and welcome to this, the second programme in the series where we walk through Infamy Infamy one step at a time and obviously focusing on all the rules mechanisms therein. Now today we're going to be looking at movement which is pretty straightforward but we're going to do this comprehensively and work through each stage of the rules. Uh, as with the last video we'll be looking at both sides individually so we can highlight their own way of operating and maybe chuck in the odd tactical tip as we go. This programme will also look at areas of Roman drill and barbarian commands where they affect movement but we won't be covering that as uh, on its own. We're going to have a whole programme on that separately when we look at command and control. Okay, firstly let's have a look at foot troops. Uh, I think we're going to look at foot troops first of all and then follow on with uh, cavalry after that. Um, we're going to look at the Romans first and uh, here we have a single group and we've, uh, we're have we going to be using some uh, groups on the table just as uh, uh, by way of example so bits and pieces cluttering around, take the notice, just focus on the bits that we're talking about. So uh, here we have a single group a single group can move in any direction it wishes with no limitations on turning during movement. Being Roman it will either be in close order or open order. Close order is a more defensive stance as we'll see when we get to the programme on combat. Open order is more aggressive and fast moving. When moving in the open a group in open order rolls 2d6 and moves that far in inches. So there we go, 7 inches. Um, when uh, doing that in close order they'd still roll the 2d6 but they'd take the lower dice off so in that situation where we rolled a 4 and a 3 they'd take the 3 off and just move 4 inches. If you roll a double you still remove one dice. When uh, moving uh, in broken ground the open order group removes the lower dice and in close order the higher dice is removed. Again you always remove one dice because obviously that's reflecting the fact you are slowed down. In dense terrain, let's say a forest or a swamp, you can't move in close order so they're going to have to be in open order to move at all and in that case they'll roll two dice and they'll remove the higher of the two. Okay well that's pretty simple but our Roman chums like to make our lives uh, difficult by having stuff like formations, some of which are going to affect movement. Uh, generally, when you get two or more groups in a formation, they're going to move in exactly the same manner that we've just outlined. That's true of the line and wedge, both of which can be in close order or open order. And we mark, we use a marker uh, to show which is which, as close order is actually closer together than you can, than you can put the figures. Um, so uh, the natural state of deployment is, this is pretty much re representing open order, so we put a marker down to show when those guys are going into close order. Um, one important thing to remember is that changing order can only be done when a group or formation is activated. A leader uses a command initiative to do it, so it's cost him an order if you like, but it doesn't actually count as movement or use any movement. So if they were moving in open order and wanted to then go into close order, they'd still roll their 2d6, they'd move that distance, and then at the end of it, as long as he's got another command initiative to do so, they can change into close order. Um, remember though, if you just stood still, and that's the only thing they do, those troops still count as though they have been activated 
during the turn, even as I say, if it's all edit. Troops in march column always count in open order because it's a uh, it's not a combat formation effectively it's uh, it's just a movement formation consequently they, they get uh, none of the defensive benefits that close order would give um, but remember they can step out more cheaply than other formations generally with just one signa card so if you need to get their fastest with the mostest a march column can be handy but just make sure that you don't get ambushed because it is a dreadful uh, formation to fight in. Troops who are in a square or an orb or in testudo always count as being close order. You can put the close order marker down if you want, but you don't need to because by definition they are. In the same way as a column is all, uh, march column is always in open order, they are always going to be close order. Um, <coughs> Excuse me. They are the ultimate defensive formation, but they're very slow moving. In the open, they would roll 2d6 and remove the higher of the two dice. Obviously, if you get a draw, they still remove one of those dice. In any other terrain, they can't move. Now, you can form up in those formations in other terrain, but they simply uh, can't move. Um, so, talking of formations... Where our single groups have got very flexible movement choices, effectively going wherever they want by just moving in that direction, formations have some restrictions. They can move obliquely up to 45 degrees and remain facing their front, or they can wheel by keeping one corner on a fixed point and then measuring from the point that moves the furthest in that formation. So this formation of two groups would either wheel from there or it could wheel there. But what it can't do is wheel from the centre. Roman formations can move forwards, they can go sideways or they can go backwards and they can always end their turn by facing in the direction of movement or turning to face the opposite way. So a Roman formation can very effectively move away from an opponent but end their turn turning to face them again and this can be a pretty big advantage in a tough spot and having to undertake fighting withdrawal especially when added with something like the punch shields in the Roman drill which allows them to break contact in a combat and then potentially fall back to buy themselves some time um, especially when they're facing an enemy whose uh, uh, fervour has been reduced to zero. Changing formation is simple. When you do want to do basic stuff like expand or uh, contract the frontage, one group simply stands still and the others manoeuvre around that. Um, and that simply removes one dice of movement. So you're not having to move for each individual group. It's simply a case of saying, right, this group is standing still and this group are going to double the frontage. Doubling or halving the frontage is the limit you can do in any one uh, turn um, in terms of changing formation. So in open terrain, these two groups could change formation and then just ro roll 1d6 for movement if in open order. If in close order, where you've already lost one movement dice, they just change formation and that is it. One quick tactical tip here. For the Roman player is that because changing uh, order uh, is simply a command and not uh, doesn't reduce movement, if you've got a, a leader with three command initiatives, uh, so that would typically be a centurion, he could start off with a group in close order, order them to change formation to open order, then move with 2d6 in the open, and then with his third command initiative, change them back into close order again. This is really reflecting high quality drill of the Romans, breaking out, rushing forward and then reassuming that formation. It is very cost heavy in terms of command initiative and once the fighting begins, it's undoubtedly not going to be top of his list of priorities. But as a tactical move, uh, especially if you're concerned about uh, being ambushed, 
uh, it is not a bad thing to do uh, as you move forward. Now, as I said earlier, some Roman drill impacts on movement. The ability to spend a Signa card uh, to allow one group or formation to move through another is handy, especially if the group at the front is battered and bruised and they can use that to simply move back through any supporting troops by playing a Signa card. If we had two groups here with another two groups behind, just one Signa card would be enough because they are in a formation to move them all back through. You wouldn't need one Signa card for each. Throwing pillar is something we're going to cover in, in missiles and uh, combat, but throwing pillar can be done at any point in the move. However, it will require a Signa card or a command initiative for the Romans. So that means they're going to be able to, if they were moving into contact with an enemy, they could roll the dice. Let's say they rolled uh, four inches in this case. They would hope they would be close enough to the enemy. They could move a couple of inches, hurl pillar, and then carry on and complete the rest of the movement. It doesn't interrupt or interfere with movement. That probably doesn't matter if they're only at four inches range. But if they were ten inches away and felt that uh, and maybe they were going to play a card to step out... Um, uh, and add an uh, extra dice of movement, or uh, two cards to step out for uh, Roman legionaries, um, then they um, may well want to throw pillar at some point during their move, which they can do, um, because the activation is simply activating them to allow them to move and um, engage the enemy with missiles, uh, as Romans using a Signa to do so, and also fighting close combat. So they could do all three of those things when activated. Let's talk Barbarians now. We'll bring some of these guys over so we can uh, have a look at them in action. Now, a single group moves precisely as a single Roman group does. It goes in any direction it wishes without any limitations on turning. But of course where barbarians differ is that they don't have formations, but rather they have mobs. To form a mob, the barbarian groups move into contact with each other, any shape you like, as long as they are in contact with another group in the mob. Once in the mob, the leader can perform his essential trick, which is to raise further. It is impossible to overemphasize how further is a key part of the barbarian game. You need to get a decent amount of further up on your groups in order to defeat the Romans. You can only raise further when you are in base-to-base -base mob con contact. Now we'll talk about this more in the uh, program on command and control, but it's important to understand some of these basic principles here and how they will affect um, movement. Uh, moving a mob is done two, in two ways. You can move in an uncontrolled manner, or you can move in a controlled manner. Moving in a controlled way means that in the open, as we've got here, you would roll 2d6 and remove the lower dice. So, there we go, we'll take the lower dice off. But, remember, what you then do is you add the amount of fervour that is on the group with the lowest amount of fervour in the mob. So, if this group had three points of fervour, this one had two and this one had one, you would add one inch of movement. It's more likely, <clears throat> because when you roll for it to increase fervour, uh, that fervour goes on all of those groups. It's very likely that their fervour levels are going to be fairly close, within one, uh, one point or so. So in an ideal world, you're going to have these guys up on around four, five, six points of fervour before they do that. So if we take off um, our, our lower dice, but we add our four, five or six inches for fervour, we're going to see that this mob is still going to be travel, travelling a decent amount of distance uh, across the table, even though it is in a controlled manner. However, if this mob is in an uncontrolled, uh, moving in an uncontrolled manner, what we do is we roll 2d6 for each group. And we do that before we move. Let's roll our dice for these guys now. So these guys then move. These, these are going to be moving 9 inches, these are going to be moving 8 inches, and these are going to be moving 4 inches. Now, <clears throat> that is going to allow you to actually make some variations in terms of 
how far they get and what sort of format they are in because these guys moving nine inches are going to be able to go there and these guys five inches are going to find themselves bringing up the rear but still very close and going to be able to support in combat. As long as these groups end up where all of them are within 12 inches of another group within the mob it still remains part of the mob even though it's not in contact with the other groups. However this additional speed comes at a cost you can't raise further on a mob that is moving in an uncontrolled manner and the movement is obviously more unpredictable. Now, as we can see here, just doing one move it probably doesn't matter. But if we did two or three moves across the table in an uncontrolled fashion it, there's a big potential for some of these groups to be falling out of uh, the mob especially if we're adding uh, signal cards to get a step out which means that you know, some groups could roll 18 inches to move and some could roll 3 inches. So there's that degree of unpredictability and when stragglers fall back from a mob and then they are much much harder to command, generally only activating on the Cigna card uh, at the end of, end of a turn and trying to get back up but somehow never quite making it in my experience. Um, it's key to remember that once you have gone uncontrolled the only way to reassemble a mob is by the leader issuing a to me command. Now that is costly in terms of uh, command initiatives. It also stops the mob moving forward and therefore they drop um, further in doing so. So be careful. The big tactical tip for this program must be that moving in a controlled manner is the way to do it until you are at the final point of delivering a charge. This is by far the most effective way of delivering an effective attack against the Romans for the barbarians. It avoids stragglers, it keeps all the groups together to deliver the maximum power or punch in the attack and you combine 2d6 with further and potentially a step out for maybe just one card and an uncontrolled mob moving is very fast indeed and on a 6 foot by 4 foot table you should not be having to use that until the moment of real attack. Um, you're going to be able to cover quite some distance um, potentially if you step out 24 inches is the maximum movement that you can achieve uh, if you've got six points of fervor on any of those groups. And remember, when you roll uh, for them individually, you're going to be adding fervor individually on those groups. So that's going to also, in some ways, potentially break up the formation more, especially if the levels of shock are uh, varied and different amongst those groups in that mob. So keeping them together until the final moment, big tactical tip for you hairy people out there. Let's talk a little bit more detail about these barbarian mobs though. A couple of things we need to cover. When they are moving, they can move obliquely up to 45 degrees to the front in the same way that Romans can do. They can wheel on a fixed point as we saw the Romans do either from one end of the mob or the other end of the mob. They cannot move sideways as the Romans do because the Romans are effectively turning to face, moving and then turning back to face. These guys um, really are not familiar with any drill manual manuals and consequently their focus is very much towards the enemy at the front. Now the mob can change its facing to the rear before moving but then it will end its movement facing in the direction of move. Unlike the Romans they can't turn to face so making that Fighting withdrawal is potentially going to expose their rear to the enemy, but uh, you know, sometimes it's a chance you've got to take. An uncontrolled mob sees each group move individually. Now they can only move straight forward or change their direction of travel by moving obliquely. They can't wheel. This is representing the fact that it's a mad charge with no control. However, it's more fluid and as we saw, you can actually manoeuvre your groups within that relatively easily, especially as you roll for each group individually. It's a bit of wiggle room to get the best shape possible when attacking. 
As we can see, generally the Barbarians are more of a blunt instrument than the Romans, but they're also faster and generally more aggressive, so it's a quid pro quo, as uh, Caesar would possibly have said. Chariot mounted warriors need a special mention. The key here is not to think of the chariot as the weapon, but the delivery vehicle or the taxi. Uh, they make men who are mounted in them very fast indeed and provide a great degree of protection when serving as a rallying point. Uniquely, they can turn twice when activated, once at the start of their movement and once again. Oh, let's get some. Okay, so imagine they are facing away from their Roman enemies here. As we've said, they can turn at the start of the move. Well, that's easy. Everybody can do that. They can then move forward and turn again at any point in their turn and then complete their movement. Uh, so that's a great opportunity uh, for a drive-by shooting. Um, also unique is their ability not to use all their movement. They can just simply move up to the total they, they have rolled. So again, ideal for that drive-by shot at the enemy. They can just simply nip into a range of their javelins at nine inches and then go straight back out. Darting into and darting out and using that as a mechanism to raise the fervour of their troops if they're lucky enough to get a kill. This is not uh, a major weapon for killing Romans. If they can chip off one or two of them, it's a double bonus. Um, because they are able to increase the fervour of troops elsewhere uh, on the table or indeed on themselves. Chariots are fast, they move with 2d6 and then they add 6. When moving in the open, in fact I didn't need to say when moving in the open because they can't move in anything else, they can't move in broken ground or dense terrain, so they like a battlefield that has got some clear open spaces which they can normally get in Britain. Um, which might be why the Germans didn't use them, or maybe they hadn't invented a wheel, who knows. Uh, the warriors on board can deploy at any time during the movement. So if you've got, I've just rolled nine for movement, to which I can add uh, six, they can deploy their warriors directly into combat, and the chariots, because that is well within the 15 inches, and then the chariots can fall back to create a rallying point there behind them. That is really important. If they get any withdrawal result, they can simply fall back onto the chariots. Even if the withdrawal uh, result is only one inch uh, fall back due to excess shock, they can uh, fall back directly onto the chariots and that provides them with a mechanism for rallying off shock automatically. And it's a great self-defense mechanism that allows them to get out of a combat that isn't necessarily going their way. It allows them then to get away and to rally off shock automatically and then once their leader has also rallied off some shock to get them back into action as quickly as possible. Now in a game where keeping the pressure on the Romans is key to defeating them, don't allow them any breathing space to use their drill to rally off that shock as they will metronomically and rather tediously if you're a barbarian. Keeping the pressure on is the key to defeating them and the chariots are a great weapon for doing that. Finally, in terms of foot troops, skirmishers deserve their own mention. These can move with 3d6 in the open, or 2d6 if in broken ground. In dense terrain, they still roll 2d6, but they take the lower dice off. Or, of course, a dice off if it is a draw. Um, if they shoot or throw missiles, they remove 1d6 of movement, so they pay a price for throwing their missiles. They suffer no penalty for moving and shooting other than the loss of that dice. So they're, they're a nimble force and they can evade away if attacked. So you can push them right up into the enemy's face to harass them very effectively. Many a Roman force has been defeated because they chased after a few idiots throwing rocks at them. Uh, anger management is clearly not on the Roman agenda. And of course, one thing I forgot with chariots is chariots can evade as well. So hanging them out to try and tempt your enemy to do something foolish can be a perfectly legitimate tactic.
Cavalry are the same, be they Roman or Barbarian, and come in two main types. You've got Mounted Warriors or you've got Skirmish Cavalry. They're simpler because horses aren't daft enough to do drill. Uh, mounted Warriors move 2d6 and add 4 inches in open ground. Skirmish Cavalry move 2d6 and add 6. Both of them remove the lower dice rolled or A dice if it's drawn, if in broken ground. And they can't operate in uh, denser terrain than that. Mounted Warriors can join with other groups of Warriors of the same type and move together on one dice roll. Think of it as a, a cavalry formation if you like, although it, that's not the terminology that we use uh, because cavalry are a lot looser in terms of the way they operate than infantry. Skirmish cavalry groups will always move individually, even if they're commanded by, a, you know, let's say a status two leader who's got them both together, they will still roll individually for each group. Um, and consequently, they may, with the leader going with one group or the other, the other one group may end up out of that command, simply reflecting the fact that these are the younger warriors and some of them are more headstrong and some of them are not particularly interested. But nevertheless, um, that's how they operate. Cavalry can move obliquely up to 45 degrees or they can wheel on the fixed point, as we've seen for our warriors. They can change direction at the start of a turn, uh, sort of their activation anyway, or they can do so at the end of their move, but that will cost them a Signa card, so they've got a bit of flexibility. Right, well, that's a look at how movement works. Um, I should mention the Scorpion, which uh, again moves exactly as infantry, um, and uh, so that, uh, that will be covered by the warriors and they move in exactly the same fashion. The type of level of, of artillery piece that we've got here is going to be manhandled and very light so there is no uh, real penalty for lugging that about. Um, so there we have it. Um, as with the first program in this series if there's anything that you feel we haven't covered or <laughs> me I haven't covered that you'd like answering then please put your comments below and we can try to answer it there and obviously that will then give us some food for the frequently asked questions which we're going to produce as the end of this series. Um, hope you enjoyed it uh, or again hopefully found it informative. We're going to be moving on with the next one which I think is missiles um, but I can't remember the running order so suffice to say we will return. I'll be back, I think somebody once said. Cheers.